certainly good to be present with fellow saints this evening in the presence of the Lord and our worship before Him. Trust that all that you see and hear this evening will be in accordance with God's will. Certainly appreciate those that are visiting with us this evening and trust that the things that we say tonight will be edifying to all. As Dale mentioned, continuing a series of studies on Satan. And this evening, I want us to look for a moment at how Satan works in churches. This passage that Blake read a moment ago, Revelation chapter 2, verse 8 and verse 11. One thing we learn from this text is that Jesus knows the condition of his churches and their struggles. He knew that added to the tribulation of earthly poverty that this church in Smyrna was uh, was going through uh, times of blasphemy and strong opposition from the Jews. The Jews in Smyrna had rejected God by their tolerance of Caesar worship, and they slandered the name of Christ. And at every opportunity, they harassed Christians by stirring up the Roman authorities against them. It's things that we learn about from history and also from things happening in the book of Revelation. A synagogue, Jesus calls them a synagogue of Satan, a synagogue was a gathering place for worship. And these Jews were not assembling to serve God, but by their blasphemy they actually worshipped and served Satan. The blasphemy and reviling at Christians by the Jews was a work of Satan. Thus Jesus calls them a synagogue or a congregation of Satan may come as a shock to some people to discover that Satan goes to church. Satan does indeed work in churches. Through his spiritual forces of wickedness, he is actually running some churches. You recall our Lord cast out demons in the synagogue. Luke has one account of it in Luke chapter 4, verse 31 to verse 37. The apostle Paul, he wrote to believers in the church at Corinth to warn them, about Satan and his devices that were at work in the church there at Corinth. 2 Corinthians in chapter 2 and verse 10, verse 11. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgotten or have forgiven that one, of your, that one for your sakes in the present for presence of Christ. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Well, nobody outside the local church can really hinder the work and worship of the church. And this is why Satan wants to get on the inside, as he did with Ananias and Sapphira. We'll look at it a little bit later in our studies. Well, where are we likely to find Satan at work in the church? Well, we're going to begin in the pulpit. Satan has his ministers who disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness. Here in this second letter written to the saints at Corinth in 2 Corinthians in chapter 11 and verse 13, verse 15, the apostle Paul is describing some that were at work there among the saints at Corinth. And he said they are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers, Satan ministers, also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their, according to their works. These ministers, these servants of Satan, were preaching a different Jesus, a different spirit, and a different gospel than the true apostles preached. Back in verse 3 and verse 4, Paul said, I fear lest somehow... As the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He explains, for if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Well, simply because a preacher is a professed Christian, a sincere and moral man, and maybe even a graduate of a theological seminary does not mean that he's truly saved and he's truly a servant of Jesus Christ. Saul of Tarsus is an example. He thought he was a child of God. He was a sincere and righteous man. He said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 6 that he was blameless concerning the righteousness of the law. And he was schooled in the finest religious seminary, we'd call it, of his day. In Acts chapter 22 
And in verse 3, he states that I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, the city of Jerusalem, at the feet of Gamal, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you are, are today. Saul of Tarsus sincerely thought he was doing the will of God when he opposed the true church at that time, persecuted the true church. Yet he was actually working for the devil. When he later became the Apostle Paul, he attributed persecution upon the church to Satan. You can read it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 18. He talks about how Satan hindered him by means of persecution. Well, he used to be doing that very thing. So he used to be a minister of Satan, unawares at least for the time. Satan, we know, made Judas an apostle of Jesus a false apostle and deceitful worker. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 3 and verse 4, the record states that Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve, the twelve apostles. So, he, so Judas went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might trade Jesus to them. Satan tried to have Peter as one of his servants, one of his ministers. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 31 and verse 32, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you return to me, strengthen your brethren. The problem of Satan working in the pulpit is not a small problem. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, the Apostle John makes this statement, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. And here's why. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. That's just the opposite of what most people think in religious world today. They think there may be a few false teachers that have gone out in the world. The record we have from God is that many false teachers have gone out into the world. The Apostle Peter in 2 Peter in chapter 2 and verse 1 and verse 2 affirming something very similar uh, makes a statement there were also false prophets among the people there in Old Testament times even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth <clears throat> will be blasphemed. The fact that Satan has false teachers throughout the world would indicate that Satan works through false doctrines. False teachings that are nothing more than the doctrines and the commandments of men. In 1 Timothy in chapter 4, in verse 1 and verse 2, Paul says, The Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, remember Satan is the deceiver, and doctrines of demons, cohorts of Satan, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. In 2 John, verse 7 through verse 11, John writes that many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Verse 9, whoever transgresses and does not in the, abide in the doctrine, the teaching of Christ, does not have God and have fellowship with God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. And he gives a warning against receiving someone who's not teaching that teaching that is of Christ and not having fellowship with them by partaking with them and greeting them and bidding them Godspeed in what they're doing. How can we tell if some preacher or some church's doctrine is true to God's will or just a teaching of man and thus a false doctrine. Well, look with me at Mark chapter, Mark chapter 7 and verse, or Mark chapter 7 verse 5 through verse 13. In Mark chapter 7 and verse 5, the Pharisees are confronting uh, Jesus, wondering why his disciples are not 
following one of their traditions. Now, they held their traditions to uh, be all important and equivalent to something that God would have them uh, to be binding upon mankind. But in Mark chapter 7 and verse 5 beginning, <clears throat> we see uh, that the Pharisees in confronting him said, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And Jesus' response said, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And he explains, For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. And he said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. And he gives an example. Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is korban, that is a gift to God, gift to the synagogue, then you no longer let him do anything for his father and mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you've handed down and many such things you do. If God's word <clears throat> says you can marry, but some church doctrine, not Christ, not Christ doctrine, keep in mind, but some church doctrine says you can't, it's a doctrine of man. It's a doctrine of demons. That's what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy in chapter 4 that we read a little bit earlier. If God's word says you can eat all foods, but some church, some church doctrine says you must abstain from certain foods, like some churches do teach, it's a doctrine of man. It's a doctrine of demons, according to what Paul stated in 1 Timothy chapter 4. If some preacher, some church doctrine lays aside or rejects the commandment of God, makes the word of God of no effect, it is a doctrine of men, a doctrine of demons. In Jesus' example, if some church doctrine says, no, you don't have to honor your father and mother, you don't have to take care of them, give your money to the church, some churches fund, and we'll help them. You don't have to do anything for them. It's a doctrine of men, a doctrine of demons. Very easy to tell whether or not we're dealing with a, something that is just a church doctrine, a church tradition, or it is indeed the doctrine of Christ. God commands belief in Christ, belief in the gospel for an individual to be saved. If man says, or some church doctrine says, Jews and Muslims can be saved without belief in Christ, they lay aside God's word, they reject God's word, they make God's word of no effect. And there are indeed some churches out there teaching that very thing today. It's a false doctrine. Same is true with respect to what some churches teach with respect to baptism not being a salvation, or practicing worship, or the works of the church that are not authorized by God's word. Well, Satan also has his agents in the pews. There are, according to what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians in chapter 11, verse 26, false brethren. And these false brethren receive and accept false doctrines. We read it a moment ago in 2 Corinthians in chapter 11, verse 3 and verse 4, where Paul said, I fear lest somehow as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. The parable of the tares teaches that Satan has children. And he sows them wherever God sows true saints. Jesus issued the parable of the tares in Matthew in chapter 13. His disciples didn't understand what he was talking about, and so they asked him to explain to them the parable of the tares. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 37 and verse, through verse 39, he gives an explanation of what this parable symbolizes. He said, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed these tares is 
the devil. How can we tell who is a son of the wicked one, who is a child of the wicked one? 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7 to verse 10. John says, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins, practices sin, is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, Son of God is manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. The tense there does not practice sin. For his seed, God's seed, remains in him. He cannot sin, can't continue practicing sin because he's been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest, made known. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. They're of the wicked one. Nor is he who does not love his brother. What happens if these children of the devil take over a church or become leaders in a church? Was it any wonder that churches depart from the faith and start to believe doctrines of demons? Satan can be present in the worship of a religious gathering. Look with me at 1 Corinthians in chapter 10 to note this being the case. In 1 Corinthians, in chapter 10, in verse 14 through verse 21, the Apostle Paul is warning against the practice of idolatry, which is very prevalent in their day, and especially there at Corinth. And in verse 14, he says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar, actually fellowshippers of the altar? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. The Corinthian Christians were being invited to attend pagan feasts and various religious gatherings that were in town that day and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Paul reminded them that the idol was nothing of itself, but still going through the motions of making offerings to idols removed the worshipers from fellowship with God and caused them to be in fellowship with demons. Now we're prone to assign this kind of a warning to uh, the heathen people in dark places of the world. But the principle behind this warning applies to saints who are not necessarily exposed to wood and stone idols. The principle here is our involvement in any form of worship that is not authorized by the one true and living God takes us away from fellowship with God and puts us in fellowship with Satan and his cohorts, the demons. Just as Satan has, uh, has counterfeit churches and a counterfeit gospel, he is behind counterfeit unauthorized worship. Not everything that passes for worship to God in many churches today is scriptural. We must take care not to get involved in the devil's religion. Worship approved by God must be done in spirit and in truth. Uh, Jesus is the one that makes this statement in John in chapter 4 and verse 23 and 24. The hour is coming, now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him, but God is, God is spirit. Those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. His reference to true worshipers indicates that there is such a thing as false worshipers out there, people that are not worshiping in accordance with God's will. And any worship that is not in spirit and truth falls short of pleasing God, pleases only Satan. God's giving no new revelations concerning worship. 
We build our worship on the truths revealed in the Word of God. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. Whatever we do in word or deed, we do it in the name of, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. The attitude of too many today is that a church should court or cater to please the world in order to try to win the world. So pressure is being applied for us to have fellowship with other religious groups and their forms of worship that are unauthorized by the God of heaven, authorized only by men. We must beware of this false fellowship. It seeks to unite Christ and Belial. In 2 Corinthians and chapter 6 and verse 14 to verse 18, the Apostle Paul told them, and the principle is for us even yet today, that we're not to have fellowship with unbelievers. In 2 Corinthians in chapter 6 and verse 14, <clears throat> do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? Lawlessness is doing things without authority from God. What communion has light with darkness? And what accord, what agreement, what fellowship has Christ with Belial? Belial is a name for Satan. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I'll be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Not have fellowship with these that are unbelievers and their unscriptural practices. Do not touch what is unclean. I will receive you, God promises. I'll be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Well, Satan can even work in the offering. <clears throat> and this is seen in the account we referred to earlier, Ananias and Sapphira, Acts in chapter 5, verse 11 verses. In verse 2, Peter said, Satan filled their heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land that they sold. Ananias and Sapphira wanted to gain the reputation for being more spiritual than they actually were. Uh, when other saints at that time uh, brought their donations as they were doing, it appears that these two were jealous of that, and they wanted to, the same recognition that was gained, by, or gained for the other saints. Uh, and their sin uh, was not stealing money from God, because Peter stated in verse 4 of the text there that it was in their power to use the money as they wished. Their sin was hypocrisy, trying to appear more spiritual than they really were. Their sin was doing what they were doing to be seen of men and to be honored of men. And Jesus certainly condemns this. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew in chapter 6, in the first four verses, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward, but their reward is not from God. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Satan sometimes shows up in the business meetings of the church. More often than not, this takes place in business meetings where there are no elders in the church, but it can take place also in business meetings held by elderships. There is a wisdom from above that is usually seen in business meetings, but sometimes there is also a wisdom from below, and James writes about this wisdom from below. In James in chapter 3 in verse 13 to verse 18. In James chapter 3 in verse 13 beginning, he says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, not from God but as earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, 
then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness sown in peace by those who make peace. Wisdom from below. It's earthly. It's sensual. It's demonic. It comes from Satan. This kind of wisdom gradually infects a life or an organization, and before long, Satan is in control. For some 50 years, I participated in many business meetings in various churches, and I fear that Satan's wisdom was often present, and some of the believers didn't even know it. And I confess to my shame, on more than one occasion, I've been guilty myself of reasoning from purely wisdom, uh, human wisdom, rather than wisdom from above, being self seeking, unwilling to yield, things of that nature that are described in this particular passage. Satan tries to lead, to use leading Christians to spread his destructive heresies, his destructive wisdom. He even used the Apostle Peter on one occasion, at least trying to use the Apostle Peter against Jesus. In Matthew in chapter 16, we have an account of it. In Matthew in chapter 16, in verse uh, 21 beginning, <clears throat> uh, Jesus was preparing his disciples for the fact that he was going to be crucified. From this time, Jesus began to show disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and be raised the third day. Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me. Satan, you are an offense to me, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Let's make certain we're mindful of the things of God and show it instead of the things of men, especially when we're dealing with the business of the church. Another area where Satan enters the organization of the church is in the leadership. It amazes me how few local churches really follow the instructions given in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. Many churches put new converts into places of leadership instead of giving them the opportunity to prove their maturity. And we've looked at the passage before, 1 Timothy in chapter 3 and verse 6, where the Apostle Paul enumerates the, the qualifications for an individual to be considered uh, in the work of the eldership, uh, a bishop, he says that they're not to be a novice, uh, lest they be puffed up with pride and fall into the same condemnation as the devil. In Acts in chapter 20 and verse 28 through 30, recall the apostles' admonitions to the elders of Ephesus. In verse 28, he says, Take heed to yourselves, to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. That's a description of false teachers. Satan's behind false teachers. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. God's not behind this. Satan would be behind this. We didn't know this morning that spiritual pride is one of Satan's chief weapons. Satan loves to lay hold of idolatrophies, who loves to have the preeminence and usually becomes kind of a sanctified obstructionist because he has to have his own way as a leader. Third John and verse 9 and verse 11, in 3 John 9 and 11, I wrote to the church, John says, But Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us the malicious words, and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren, and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Finally, we make note that Satan tries to work in the church through an unforgiving Spirit. We've noted this a couple of times in our studies of Satan's devices. We emphasize it again simply because it's emphasized by our Lord and also emphasized by his apostles. In 2 Corinthians, in chapter 2, and verse 6 through verse 11, the context that we uh, 
I had a passage we started out with in a lesson here this evening. In 2 Corinthians in chapter 2 and verse 6, Paul says, This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man, somebody that they disciplined and now has repented. So that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. That is what Satan wants to have happen to this individual. The individual knows that he's repented, but here he's dealing with brethren who apparently wouldn't forgive him. And so he'd be swallowed up with, too much, with so much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end, I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I've forgiven anything, I've forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Look with me at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 14 and verse 15. Jesus in this context was teaching his disciples how to pray, what to say in their prayers. And one of the things they pray for is that God would forgive them as uh, that, that they would forgive others as God had forgiven them. And then he explains why he said that in verse 14 and verse 15 of Matthew chapter 6. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. If you're living with sins that are not forgiven by God because God will not forgive your sins since you refuse to forgive others. Whose camp does that put you in? God's camp or Satan's camp? Living with unforgiven sins. The implication is clear. Unforgiving spirit is a way that Satan works in churches. Let's all strive to learn to detect and defeat Satan. Let's make certain that Satan is not using us to hinder the Lord's cause through any of these means we looked at in our study this evening. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27, do not give place to the devil. Do not give opportunity to the devil through these things. And James writes in James chapter 4 and verse 7, we read this morning, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Let's make certain that we're doing that also. Are you submitting your life to God? Are you submitting, as we studied this morning, your will to God's will? God's will is that you believe in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. It's God's will that you repent and change your mind about the way that you've been living. Uh, that's against God's will. It's God's will that you confess before men your faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. It's God's will that you be baptized, immersed in water for their mission to pass sins. Are you submitting to God's will? That's how we resist Satan and Satan's attacks against us today. As a child of God, are you continuing to live a life of submission, humble submission to God's will in your life? If not, then God's will is that you repent of that, that you confess that sin before Him, pray to God for forgiveness of that sin. We're here ready to assist you in that desire this evening. If we can assist anyone in their desire to obey the Lord tonight, come forward and make it known as we stand and sing this song. <laughs> Thanks, God,